I'd like to welcome those of you who managed to get here. Uh, and thank you for coming. Uh, this is for uh, for us the the fourth event in our series on the politics of memory in global context, which, as many of you know, is a joint Franco-American project, and it was founded and is now co-directed by Professor Denis Pichonsky, who would stand up except that his computer will fall down. He knows how to do. Who has come from Paris uh, just for our workshop, and as I said, is the founding um, uh, scholar of this project, and it is now run by um, by uh, Professor Pichonsky and Brigitte Sion, who is a um, a scholar, of, an anthropologist, performance studies scholar of memory, and currently a postdoc at Columbia, and by me, and I'm Carol Gluck. Uh, the uh, I'm a historian of Japan. The uh, we have, you can see on your, uh, on the back of your program, the rest of the uh, events for this year will not take place in New York. They will take place in Istanbul and Amman. Uh, uh, but we'll be back in New York next year, and we hope you will come and to our events then. Uh, the hallmark of this project is that we combine disciplines, uh, humanists and social scientists who study collective memory neuroscientists, cognitive scientists, and psychologists who study individual memory, and uh, directors and curators of historical memorial museums. And our main museum partners from the beginning of the project have been the Memorial de Caen, the World War II His <coughs> Museum in France, and the National 9-11 uh, Memorial Museum in New York. And I see that Professor uh, William Hurst, who I'd like to stand up, please, who is a, he can stand up. Uh, uh, thank you. Is a psychologist who's worked on 9/11 and has been part of the project from the beginning. He's from the New School. So today, we are talking about the politics of memory in East Asia and Eastern Europe. And I think you'll understand when you hear the talks why we have put Eastern Europe and East Asia together. Uh, just a quick uh, introduction uh, of the speakers. Just adding things that are not on the uh, bios that you have on the other side of your program. Uh, Professor Yoshimi, who has come to us from Tokyo, and we're very grateful for him for coming, who is the uh, historian, the scholar, who has done the most research on the question of the comfort women, uh, who is the one who, what I call my hero historians, who went into the archives and found the documents that proved that the Japanese Imperial Army did indeed establish the comfort stations while the current Japanese government was denying this, uh, so that this is bringing the, the facts to bear on a very contested memory issue, which is now, again, back in the news. Um, uh, and one more plug for Professor Yoshimi. Another of his books, that book, The Comfort Women, is already available in English, published 2000. A new book, a translation of his classic called Grassroots Fascism, Experience of Ordinary People, uh, is, will be published this coming month from Columbia University Press. So we have two of Yoshimi's fine works in English. Uh, Professor Da Ching Yang, uh, uh, who is described here, uh, uh, he's a professor of history and, and international affairs at George Washington. He's actually unusual in more than one way. First of all, he does Japanese history, but he also does Chinese history. He does he, he can work in, across Sino-Japanese relations in a way that many historians have, have, uh, cannot. And secondly, he's distinguished by the fact that he has been involved in public memory, as has Professor Yoshimi, for a very long time. In fact, almost as long as Professor Yoshimi, and you can see that there's a somewhat of an age difference, which says that Professor Young started very young. <laughs> uh, very young, uh, already in the 1980s, uh, uh, in, in conjunction with the uh, uh, anniversaries of the Nanjing Massacre. And he has been a historian's voice, bringing again a cool and calm uh, um, analysis of the facts of these difficult pasts to bear on the very heated controversies that surround these in public memory. Um, and Professor Kubik, who uh, used to be at Rutgers but has, has abandoned us, um, I guess, uh, for University College London, uh, recently where he now is, who is um, now the director of the School of Slavonic and Eastern European Studies and has written on, uh, on politics, history, and culture. Uh, 
at, in Eastern Europe. The, uh, he's a cross-disciplinary person himself, political anthropology. He crosses uh, disciplinary lines. The book most relevant uh, to our topic today is 20 Years After Communism, The Politics of Memory and Commemoration uh, in Eastern no, Politics of Memory and Commemoration, yeah. period. Um, Oxford, 2014, and oh. I recommend that to you. He is now working, I was very interested to hear, on a, uh, an international project on the role of civil society and democratization, which includes South Korea, Taiwan, Hungary, and Poland. So I think they have their work cut out for them. Um, so we're very happy to have you here. And as our commentators, uh, we have uh, Professor Manan Ahmed, who some of you may know. He's an assistant professor of history, uh, South Asian history here, uh, who is a very broad um, uh, intellectual historian whose work covers everything from the ninth century to uh, the day before yesterday. And he, um, it's true, it's true. You can talk about anything, you'll see. Um, and he's involved in lots of different interesting uh, initiatives, including one in digital humanities. But his forthcoming book is really, I, I think, pathbreaking. It's called a a a, a, a conquest. Right, that right? A conquest of pasts, histories of Islam's arrival in India from the ninth to the thirteenth century. This is a very, you can imagine, mythically narrated story uh, over time. Uh, which could really use an intellectual history of these these uh, overlaid uh, mythic narratives. So uh, we're very happy to have him here today. And the most relevant memory issue for uh, Professor Ahmed is is, uh, is the is the Indian Pakistan uh, memory of partition, you know, uh, which is closing in a couple years on seventy years itself, and then. Um, uh, uh, Yael Danieli, who is a clinical psychologist uh, who has done an enormous amount of work uh, in trauma uh, and victimology and uh, worked with Holocaust survivors and children of Holocaust survivors over the years. And her, the book for her that makes the most contact with our work today is International Handbook of Multigenerational Legacies of Trauma. She has also developed a, 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 an index of measurement uh, uh, for these multi-generational legacies of trauma, which is called by her name, the Danielli Inventory of Multi-Generational Legacies of Trauma. So the, this, uh, 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 Dr. Danielli brings to us the, the psychological um, perspective on, uh, on the memories of uh, traumatic past. So we're going to um, ask each of the uh, main speakers, that the three speakers, to speak uh, not too long. And then uh, we will have uh, the commentators. And because of Professor Ahmed's, Ahmed's schedule, we're going to have the break after you speak so that you can have your, if you need to have coffee, go ahead, but, but since he has to leave. So I'd like to start with Professor Yoshimi, who has been kind enough to, uh, to read his paper in English. Oh. Thank you. Right. Very close. Okay. Kiss it, yeah. I'd like to talk about Japanese memory. You're not. You're not, I don't think oh. you're coming across. Is it really? Uh, is it really all we can get for, for making it louder? Is this one better? There's a switch on those things. This one seems. Yeah, let's switch. Right. Let's let's try this. Let's do this switch. Exactly. <laughs> talk about Japanese memories of the Asian Pacific War and Kompot women issue today. The Asia Pacific War was the first war in which Japan experienced a total defeat. In the immediate aftermath of the experience, the Japanese war memory focused mostly on Japanese suffering during the final year of the war with little examination of what Japan itself had done during the war. People remember not that Japan had attacked others in the beginning of the war, but that Japan was attacked at the end of the war by American air raids and atomic bombs at home and the violence of Soviet troops. And <laughs> <laughs> the 
violence of Soviet troops as they invaded Northeast East China in the final days of conflict in August 1945. In post Japan, the awareness of Japanese aggression was thus overwhelmed by a sense of victimization. This so-called victim consciousness helped to nurture a strong desire for peace among post Japanese. As popular sentiment against war and militarism started to dominance for the first time in Japan's modern history. It may perhaps be compared to the uh, weariness that the Japanese felt at the end of the 16th century civil war during the warring state period uh, <coughs> the of the day. The uh, denunciation of war doctrine proposed by General Douglas MacArthur and written into Article 9 of the 1947 Constitution suited these popular fascist sentiments. Can't hear? Can't hear? No, not really. Even I can So maybe speak louder? Okay. Scream. Okay. Okay. Scream. And only 27 percent oh. of the Japanese supported Article 9 in 1942, the year... 52. The, uh, 1952, the year occupation ended and Japan became independent. Uh, majority support for Article 9 gathered strength with the rise of the anti uh, nuclear uh, movement during the 1950s, especially after the radiation exposure in 1954 uh, of the Japanese fishing vessel, uh, Rocket Round Number. No. Five uh, Daigo Kumar by the U.S. hydrogen bomb test at the Bikini Atoll in South Pacific. Over the 70 years since the end of the war, Japan became that rare power whose military killed no foreign nationals and so few of its citizens died in armed conflict. The awareness that the Japanese military and the Japanese people who had supported their action had been the aggression in the Asia-Pacific War grew gradually during the 1960s. After the intensification of the Vietnam War in 1965, the battlefield made a broadcast by Japanese media arose a sense of deja vu among viewers, bringing to mind the action of the Japanese military in China in the late 1930s and 1940s. <coughs> a new uh, trend surfaced after the 1972 normalization of diplomatic relations between Japan and China, which coincided with the aging of Japanese war veterans, some of whom began to talk about their experience in China out of a desire to be freed before they died from the mental anguish and guilt they felt because of atrocities they committed against the Chinese military <coughs> citizens as well as uh, people of Southeast uh, Asian countries. One after another, former soldiers began to uh, began publishing memo memoirs of their the experience, sometimes privately. According to NHK poll between 1982 and 1994, there uh, are consist 48 to 51 percent of Japanese agreed with the statement that the 50 years history of Japan from the first Sino Japanese War to the Pacific War was a history of invasion of neighboring Asian countries. Thus, also, uh, this view represented a near majority opinion. It was not an overwhelming one. In, in contrast, those who nationalized Japan's modern war, wars and uh, agreed that as a resource poor country, Japan had to invade other countries for the sake of survival, account, um, accounted for 54% in 1982 down to 32% in 1994. Despite this gradual decline, the number of those nationalizing the war remaining considerable in addition and 
average of 27%. Uh, so that Japan's Moran war both amounted to a history of invasions and at the same time were also not unavoidable. This opinion makes sense to me, although it usually accounted for only around one third of the total in the, in the polls. With the end of the Cold, the Cold War in 1989, people in other Asian countries began to make claims for damages that they had suffered at the hand of Japanese military during the Asia Pacific War. The iconic case is the issue of the military convoy to women, which is again so much in news today. Mm -hmm. The issue emerged in public discourse after the former Co Korean cohort woman Kim Hakson told her story publicly in 1991 in connection with the shoot she filed uh, with two other former cohort women to demand compensation from the Japanese government. The Japanese government responded that it was private operators who supplied the women and that the state was not involved. Because I believe this not to be true, I began archival research and published the result in the uh, Asahi newspaper in January 1992. I found various official documents, including an order by expeditionary force of Imperial Japanese Army to build Komoto Station. Evidence that expeditionary force was uh, supervising and regula uh, regulating those stations and instructions from the Ministry of Army to expeditionary force uh, to maintain close relations with private op operators in cooperation with local and military police. As a result of these re Revelation. In 1992, Prime Minister Miyazawa mm -hmm. acknowledged the involvement of the military and apologized. In 1993, Chief Cabinet Secretary Kono Yohei issued a statement known as the Kono Statement, acknowledging that the conflict of women, women system with the involvement of the military it caused a grave violation of the human rights of women. The statement also acknowledged that Korean women were recruited, transported, and managed through caution and deception against their will. Also acknowledged was the fact that uh, local women in battle areas were at times uh, taken by force by military authorities. It appeared that the issue was settled by the statement, although the question of whether the military or private operators had created the concrete human system and of, of who were the main responsible uh, remained ambiguous. Again, on the occasion of the 15th anniversary of the end of the war in 1995, Prime Minister Murayama issued a statement with, uh, which acknowledged Japan's historical responsibility for colonial rule and invasion in Asia. Also, in 1995, the Japanese government created the Asian Women's Fund, Fund mm -hmm. to distribute compensation payment from private collected fund and a consolation payment for, for medical support from government fund to former comfort women in South Korea, Taiwan, and the Philippines. Mm -hmm. But neither fund nor government formally acknowledged the Japanese military as an agent that create and maintain the comfort women system, and the government refused any state compensation to the surviving women. For this reason, a number of former victims refused to accept the payment from Asian Women's Fund. Also excluded from these payments were Indonesian 
and Dutch victims, and those in China, Malaysia, Thailand, uh, East Timor were also ignored. No victims from Vietnam, Burma, or India uh, can, came forward. The Asian uh, Women Fund made its final payment in uh, 2007. Prime Minister Abe Shinzo's first cabinet in uh, 2006 to 2007 and his second uh, 2012 to the present have been uh, vocally critical of both Kono and Murayama apologies and acknowledgement of war responsibility and they seek, if possible, to revise them. Their activism has resulted in the recent uh, removal of all mentioned of a comfort women in middle school textbook, which were first <coughs> introduced in the late 1990s. Although many high school textbooks uh, still uh, retain the account of comfort women, the right wing is now aiming to remove them as well. A right wing activists and politicians have also uh, uh, renewed it, the argument that there was no caution involved in the comfort women system. They uh, contend that if the military authorities were not involved in <laughs> using force and threat to take women, then neither the military nor our government have any responsibility and that there is no evidence that they did use caution. In short, they say without proof of a a link between the military and the use of force, there is no responsibility. There may not be evidence that the military engaged in <coughs> systematic kidnapping of women in Korea and Taiwan, but there is indeed evidence that this happened in China, Philippines, and Indonesia. And in Taiwan and Korea, there is a great deal of evidence that the Japanese military authorized the private operators to uh, procure women through abduction and human trafficking. Hmm. A part of uh, the right wing acknowledges this, but insists that then the blame should fall on operators, not to the military or the state. Certainly, operators who kidnapped and trafficked the women as well as the parents who sold their daughters into sexual slavery via responsibility, but the right uh, failed, failed to see that the responsibility was the military that placed women taken by such criminal means into conversation is far greater. In, uh, in 2012, Hashimoto Toru, a founder of the right-wing Japan Restoration Party and current mayor of Osaka, began to make a statement similarly to those of Prime Minister Abe. In 2013, he said that the comfort women system was necessary during the war and advised the uh, commander of the U.S. forces in Okinawa to make use the uh, local prostitution industry. These remarks were immediately met with round of criticism inside and outside Japan, but he didn't uh, retract his, his statement that the uh, insisted Japan, Japanese military did not use force to recruit comfort women. He also maintained that other uh, militaries had their own version of the comfort women system. When Mayor Hashimoto appeared at the Foreign Correspondent Club of Japan in 2013 to explain his views, Sakurao Chumiki, then a diet representative in the lower house from the same right-wing party, called my book uh, Comfort Women in uh, 1994. English translation uh, 
Colombia University Press uh, uh, 2000 uh, fabrication. I sued him for <laughs> libel and uh, uh, defamation and demanded compensation for damage. During the trial, Sakura Uchi, uh, who lost his uh, permanent seat in 2014, uh, insisted that the idea that the compartment was sexual slaves was a fabrication, that the world accepted this idea because of what I said in my book, and that I had uh, defamed the owner of the Japanese government and the Japanese people. Uh, this trial uh, is still uh, under, uh, underway today. Mm -hmm. The judgment will be uh, given uh, in case by the end of this year. Uh, last year, uh, Asashi newspaper, which had read media reporting the Kongo women issue in 1980s and the 1990s, uh, disrupted the part of its reporting that had been <coughs> based on unconfirmed confirmed testimony. Uh, Yoshida uh, Seiji, who has claimed uh, that he had witness the Japanese military uh, forcefully rounding, rounded up young Korean girls <coughs> to become sex slaves. The uh, conservative media and the government have used the uh, detraction to indulge in relentless Asahi bashing as well as comfort women bashing in which they uh, <coughs> gave the uh, uh, Voluminous testimony of former Kongfu women as false and unreliable. Uh, since the Asashi uh, detraction, Prime Minister Abe has made even bolder statement. For example, in the uh, budgetary committee session mm -hmm. of the lower house of diet on October uh, 3rd, uh, 2014, he said, it is a fact that because of the Asahi's false report, many people were hurt, saddened, and outraged. The image of Japan has been uh, tarnished, and we still suffer from baseless uh, uh, denigration that Japan sexually enslaved women. The question of whether the comfort women system could be called sexual slavery has emerged as another point of contention. While right wing political opinion is represented by the ruling Liberal Democratic Party and the conservative Yomiuri and Sankei newspapers have strengthened their insistence that the Japanese government bears no responsibility for comfort women, another movement is taking shape. It involves Japanese uh, liberals who hold that Japan does indeed have a certain degree of responsibility on the comfort women issue, but that this was resolved by Kono statement and the Asian Women's Fund. Some even hold that uh, relations between Japan and South Korea have worsened because of the activists of the supporters of former comfort women who are uh, uh, pressing the government of to officially compensate the victim. It appears that even the liberal newspapers, Asahi Shimbun uh, and Mainichi Shimbun, supported the uh, position that this was resolved by the Kong statement and Abe, uh, Asahi uh, Asian Women's Fund. The, uh, the Asahi recently published a book entitled uh, Kongo to Women of Empire by uh, Pak Yuha, which had been uh, praised by uh, many liberal intellectuals.
One of Park's argument is that、uh, Korean private operators were to blame for the conflict women system, and that Japanese government bears no legal responsibility. I would like to conclude by mentioning two recent、uh, promising developments I have observed in the course of my、uh, trial and recent research. First, It has never been clear why the Comfort Women System should be called sexual slavery. According to the 1962 Slavery Convention, slavery is defined as the status or condition of a person over whom any or all of the powers attached to the right of ownership is exercised. This definition Was affirmed by the 1956 Supplementary Slavery Convention and the Rome Statute of the International、yep. Criminal Court of 1998.、Sure. Article 7 of Rome Statute defined enslavement as the exercise of any or all of the powers attaching to the right of ownership of a person. And includes the exercise of such power in the course of trafficking in persons, in particular women and children. Also, according to International Criminal Court's element of crimes, one of the conditions that makes enslavement a crime against humanity is that the per perpetrator exercises any Or all of the powers attaching to the right of ownership over one or more persons, such as purchasing, selling, lending, or bartering such a person or persons, or by imposing on them a similar dep deprivation of、uh, liberty. In according with these definitions, in、uh, 2001, the ICC ruled on a, a current incident that sexual enslavement of women did take place during the Yugoslavian Wars. In 2008, the Australian Supreme Court ruled in a Tang incident that Thai women were placed into. The condition of sexual slavery. This development makes it clear that the condition of the enslavement is not the right of ownership, but the exercise of any or all of the power attaching to the right of the ownership, including not only the status of the enslaved, but also the condition. Here, the central question is whether. One exercise a、uh, depri deprivation of liberty. The Comfort Women system was clearly a system of sexual slavery in that women were deprived of their freedom of residence, their freedom to come and go as they wished, their freedom to choose sexual partners, and their freedom to leave their employment. Second, In the process of the recent research, it became clear that research on the materials of other countries in regard to the war <coughs> on gender issues is now, is now underway. The facts are becoming known not only about the conflict women system of Japanese military and the similar system of German Reichswehr. But also about the post war South Korean military's c o n h o t women system. The UN forces c o n h o t women during the Korean War and the、uh, French so called Maison de t o l é r a n c e etc. While the light in, light in Japan evokes the example of other countries' militaries in order to deflect blame from Japan. But we hope, in contrast, to deepen research on these issues precisely in order to end the sexual violence against 
women in white hair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Kara, for your overly generous uh, introduction. Uh, at least I want to say one point is true. That is, uh, I have been struggling with this issue of war memory since the 1980s. Um, and in particular, I was have been struggling with the question, why China's uh, memories of the Second World War has changed so much compared to when I used to remember as a little child. And then more recently, I've also been struggling with the question, why, in particular, in this Chinese uh, current memory of World War II victimhood, the suffering is accorded such a prominent role. <coughs> so uh, in view of your project being a uh, US, French, uh, Asian, European uh, comparative perspective, I'd like to start with an anecdote uh, that involved a very prominent French uh, person, uh, Simone de Bois, <laughs> as you may know, uh, who uh, is a, a very well-known writer, uh, feminist, who traveled to China in 1955, and he was she was accompanied by a <laughs> Chinese writer, uh, a, a woman, Chen, uh, on a tour of China, and they visited the city of Nanjing. And they just so happened that they also saw a group of Japanese visitors <coughs> in the distance. And so uh, Simone de Bois asked her Chinese companion what was on her mind when she saw Japanese visitors. Because as she said, that for French people at this time, when they saw first German visitors to France, what came to their mind was war atrocities. To Simone de Bois' surprise, uh, Madame Chen only had a faint smile on her face and replied that we pre prefer to forget about the war. And although I wasn't born at that time yet, uh, I can relate to this sentiment uh, in my childhood, uh, growing up in the city of Nanjing, uh, and I hardly knew anything about what has known to be the Nanjing atrocity, or rape of Nanjing, or Nanjing massacre, uh, which now dominate the memory landscape uh, of China's uh, World War II memory. So ever since then, ever since the 80s, uh, I've been puzzled with this question, why uh, this was not made known? Now, it's not that I grew up without any memory of the past uh, through public education. Indeed, there were. So one might even argue that there were other memories that were actively uh, promoted uh, in China in the late 60s, early 70s. And so what were they? Well, number one, uh, the memories, well, in this case, the uh, collective memories of uh, communist-led struggle against the nationalist, the domestic rival uh, that uh, is associated with the so-called old society. So what is emphasized is the exploitation of the peasants by the landlord class. So I can re remember one of the most uh, sort of memorable uh, sort of history or memory uh, program was something called the Rent Collecting Court. The Rent <coughs> Collecting Court uh, referred to a particular landlord in western China, Sichuan province, who had particularly cruel ways to punish poor peasants who couldn't pay the rent. And then a certain Chinese artist created this uh, a, a group of statues sort of try to recreating the scene where the poor peasants were abused. And these statues then were replicated and then were reproduced in every major cities in China. So school kids like myself as well as adults were taken to these sites to have this visual encounter 
with what the poor suffering <coughs> peasant class were like in the old society before the communists. Now, there were also other memories, uh, which is not to say the World War II memory was entirely not, I mean, it's not entirely absent. So what is presented in you know, popular films and, uh, and stories was the heroic resistance led by the Chinese communists. So absent in this uh, narrative were the entire uh, history of the resistance by the KMT, the nationalists. So that partly explains why uh, an event like the atrocities in Nanjing, which happened after all in the former capital of the nationalist government, was almost entirely missing. So then something happened, and to me, this change in China at the end of 1970s provide a key reference point. Because to me, that changed what one scholar called the frame of remembrance in post-revolutionary China. So what changes are we talking about? Well, uh, the death of Mao in 1976, the end of the Cultural Revolution, the ascendance of more pragmatic leaders like Deng Xiaoping, which <coughs> reoriented China from this ideologically driven, revolutionary oriented view of the world toward a, uh, a China that is to rebuild itself into a modern nation state. So abandoned to a great extent is this class struggle revolutionary view of history. So no longer are we talking about the peasant rebellions, the peasant class that uh, were constantly uh, exploited by the evil landlord class, and rather we see more attention to the so-called century of humiliation. And I would argue initially this was not particularly targeted against any specific country including Japan, but rather it was to serve as a diversion from that internal class struggle and to mobilize the public to build the so-called four modernizations. But nonetheless, this would have important implications for how China look at the war memory. So for one thing, what used to be talked about as the Japanese people uh, is now gradually replaced by the term Japanese. In Chinese would be 日本人民, uh, 日本人民, being replaced by 日本人 or Japanese. Uh, I've done a, a quick uh, database search in People's Daily, you can see this trend where the use of Japanese people, which in the Chinese context is a very class-based uh, <laughs> concept that emphasize the common interest between the Chinese people and the Japanese people, <coughs> gradually being replaced by terms that is more kind of holistic, that treat the Japanese as a kind of ethnic nation without this class differentiation. And then secondly, uh, we see more of a, uh, I would say, the local politics playing an important <laughs> role in the crafting of war memories. Now, in the case of Nanjing, uh, we all know that there is a, a very uh, big uh, public memorial that was constructed in the 1985 and interestingly enough, it is the local government has been taking initiative in uh, creating this uh, memorial uh, space. And it's not only the government, but in some cases, even we have in China private war museums. The most prominent one is in Sichuan, an area that was not directly impacted by the war in the sense of direct invasion or occupation, but nonetheless, uh, some half a million uh, resident of Sichuan joined the war effort. So in this case, a private businessman uh, created probably the largest uh, museum cluster, including several museums uh, devoted to uh, the war, a Second World War, and the contribution made by uh, Sichuan residents. And the most recent uh, so-called national commemoration of the Nanjing atrocities, which happened last year uh, on the anniversary in December uh, 
last year, which was attended by Chinese President Xi Jinping for the first time, also was a result of many of the local initiatives. Uh, I would say the curator of this uh, memorial played a key role. Um, he has been curator for over 10 years, which is a very long period of time. He related to me that he has a passed over possibility for promotion to higher uh, positions because he really feel dedicated to uh, sustaining the memories of uh, the Nanjing victims. So it's already several years ago he's been working with local representatives in the national, the equivalent to the uh, parliament, which is called the People's uh, Congress, to uh, raise this uh, the resolution, to propose a resolution to designate December 13th as the national commemoration. And after a few uh, attempts, uh, in early last year it was adopted by the uh, National Co People's Congress, and as a result, the President of China, Xi Jinping, uh, visited uh, the city. I would also argue that in addition there were uh, global uh, influences. <coughs> Uh, for example, this curator uh, of the memorial was a particular uh, fund of appropriating sort of foreign uh, memorial practices. For example, uh, in the Nanjing Memorial, you will now find sort of ha uh, footprints of former individual victim survivors, uh, rape survivors or uh, massacre survivors. And even in create, created a wall where the names of individual victims are engraved. And he, at one point, even called a wailing wall. Um, not surprisingly, he did visit uh, Yat Vashem, and mm -hmm. he wrote about it uh, kind of proudly. So, back to my question about this, uh, the, the, the sort of the prominence of the victim uh, status uh, in the, the more recent post-revolution post-revolutionary Chinese uh, remembrance. I think this also has something to do with uh, what uh, you know, historian Charlie Mayer once called this uh, sort of global memory of trauma and victim after the end of the Cold War. And his point is that uh, with the end of this ideological struggle over who can predict a better future, now our energy and attention is now devoted to the past and to recover our trauma in order to earn respect. And I think this uh, partly explains uh, not just China, but to some extent I would argue the Korean uh, uh, memorial practice of focusing on the suffering. Uh, one can also argue, uh, maybe from a psychological point of view, that for victims to come forward to claim their victim status, you need strength and courage. And to some extent, it is not surprising that it is when China has now been considered to be on the rise uh, of achieving, you know, a, a sort of economic powerhouse status that they can comfortably claim their victim status uh, in the past. So let me conclude. Uh, we are now in the year of the 70th anniversary of World War II, and uh, uh, many public commemoration events are being uh, planned uh, in Asia and in Europe. Uh, interesting enough, uh, China and Russia, uh, two presidents last year agreed to hold a number of joint commemorative events. And of course with uh, important geopolitical uh, implications. Uh, and. Uh, if we focus on these uh, you know, commemorative events such as the upcoming Chinese military parade on September the 3rd, which is the surrender day of Japan uh, aboard Mrs., uh, uh, USS Missouri in 1945, I think we are easily uh, led to believe that the memory politics inevitably lead to further conflict in the region. And I think this is a scenario that even leaders in the region uh, are aware of. So 
if I may, I want to just end up with a slightly uh, hopeful note. And I want to go to uh, Mr. Xi Jinping's uh, speech he delivered uh, at the first public memorial in Nanjing uh, last year. Um, it's a speech I, I looked at very closely, and uh, there are parts I feel somewhat dis disappointed with. Uh, there are parts I'm not entirely sure uh, why he even said certain things. But I want to point out the fact that the word peace appeared 20 times. Um, now, there are different ways of reading this. Uh, I want to point out that uh, the Memorial Nanjing has, in some ways, also incorporated this message of peace, although in a somewhat contradictory way, because at the very end of this tour, you see a huge, tall monument of a mother holding a child. Uh, of course, that's you know, engraved with the term peace in Chinese. Uh, but I think what's the most interesting part in this speech delivered by the President of China is a line that in some ways resonate with some of the official discourse from the earlier period. That is, when he said that we should not hate an entire country because of the existence of a few militarists. Now, he didn't use the term, old terminology of Japanese people, but I think the message is rather clear. And I think he was cognizant of the fact that in the younger generation who grew up in this post-revolution China, used to this terminology Japanese, uh, the tendency of lumping all Japanese together is a real danger. Uh, we've already seen that in various street demonstrations where what we can call the more extremist slogans are displayed, uh, calling for a massacre of Tokyo. Um, so I think being the leader of China, there's also the danger of being confronted with a more nationalistic public. So the question is, as the leader of a country of over one billion people, uh, whether this message will indeed resonate with the public. And I also would argue that for people studying memory of China, there's a void, a vacuum, namely we don't know how much the social actors, the cultural memory factor in. Uh, otherwise, we will end up with a purely top-down top uh, kind of approach to understanding uh, Chinese uh, memory. And I think that's inadequate. I'm reminded of uh, an article that came out on the American Historical Review in 1997 by uh, a scholar, Arlong Confino, who talked about the collective memory cultural history, the problem of the methods, and uh, uh, he emphasized the need to go beyond simply the narrow politics of memory to look into social and cultural aspects of memory. Uh, he also reminded us in each society, it's always there are competing memories uh, instead of just one official memory. So I think uh, in this regard, uh, much work remains to be done for us to better understand the post-revolution memory of China. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Thank you to all the organizers for bringing me here. It's coming home for me a little bit. Um, so I'm always very happy to be back at this campus. Um, I apologize to those of you who are sitting there, but um, I'm not sure how well you will be able to see. I will try to use some images to 
just support uh, uh, several points I want to make. Um, I started working on the politics of memory um, about five years ago, and that book, um, which is called 20 Years After Communism, The Politics of Memory and Commemoration, the whole project was prepared with my friend and uh, collaborator, Michael Bernard. <clears throat> and our friendship with Michael Bernard started in this building, actually. <laughs> so this is very uh, exciting to, to be back here. I, I, my, my PhD is in anthropology. Michael also was in political science. So this is a friendship between a political scientist and anthropologist. And since the, our common years here in the Institute of East Central Europe, <clears throat> we always were thinking about doing something together. And finally, last year, we published a book together with a number of collaborators. Uh, the book offers a, a theory of politics of memory, which I would not be talking about, but some elements of um, my conceptual and theoretical apparatus are, are, of course, taken from the book, although it will be very, very light, and it will be more about the topic than about our um, theories. Um, <clears throat> so I will focus mostly on Eastern Europe, but it is uh, something that um, the comparison with Western Europe is uh, something I've started looking into about a year ago, and uh, so this is all very preliminary. Um, I try to organize my thoughts somewhat systematically, but please take it with a grain of salt. This is a, a, a bunch of preliminary hypotheses, although some, some of the facts I, I will be uh, showing you perhaps are already relatively well um, established. So I, I have three goals in this presentation, uh, a brief, very brief review of literature, particularly uh, uh, ideas of Aleida Asmans about the periodization of the European memory, West European memory, I should say, after World War II. The second, the problem of asynchrony between the West versus the East for obvious reasons, the, the Cold War. Um, but then a dramatic change of the situation, um, uh, particularly after the entrance of some Central European states to European Union, that is 2004. And what I, um, the third point is about cacophony in the East after 2004. Uh, the post-World War II gradual unification of Europe has always involved a very complex and politicized process of building and disseminating a common European memoir. It's a project, it is very contested, there are many different um, actors in it and many different visions and versions of what might be a, a common European memory. But eventually two features of this protest process emerged to the forefront. One is that the, the idea that the Holocaust should be the center around which the common European memory should be built. This idea emerged in the West and, and um, in Western Europe. Um, eventually, as you will see, it is beginning to play a very important role also in um, after 2004 when, or after 89 when this division between East and West at least to a point disappeared. Um, so Europe was divided and that's the second very important um, uh, observation until 89 and therefore the process which, in which the state always plays a very important role of building collective memory uh, progressed along two different uh, trajectories, and I will try to quickly outline those trajectories. Um, much of what I will say is related to the conference on two totalitarianisms and the memory of Holocaust I had participated in Warsaw in November. The conference was devoted, the, uh, devoted to the memory of Jan Karski. I don't know how many of you know about him. He was the uh, courier from the Polish underground who actually witnessed personally, he smuggled himself to Helmno, to the concentration camp, and the, he brought the information to the West about the, the final solution. When he arrived uh, in Washington, he was met by Roosevelt, but also Frankfurter, and there's this very famous exchange between Karski and Frankfurter. Frankfurter said, who was then the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Mr. Karski, a man like me talking to a man like you must be totally frank. So I must say, I am unable to believe you. It is uh, a very powerful statement. I, I think that after 2004, some at least governments and politicians from the East and West are telling each other, we are unable to believe you. <laughs> we cannot 
understand why you want to tell the history or create a vision of history that you are trying to do. So they are in this situation somewhat structurally similar to the situation uh, between Karski and Frankfurter, the way Frankfurter reported it. <clears throat> uh, a bit of a theory, just, just very lightly to, to organize my, my, my ideas. Uh, during the 70 years since the end of World War II, the process of constructing memory has passed through several stages. This is about the West. If we would start thinking about various factors that influence the process of building uh, common memory, we will uh, perhaps come up, come up with a long list. Uh, what I have here is just four things. You have a construction of collective historical memory per se, and uh, agents in the West are predominantly secular. Uh, as I started putting this all together, I realized that there's a very interesting difference. In the East, there's an increasing, sig increasingly significant role of religion and churches, which you don't see in Western Europe in this process. Second, you have issues of historical justice, or uh, transitory justice, as it is called, um, and you have clearly different, divergent, sometimes trajectories, the East and the West. Third, all of this involves uh, is, is somewhat implicated in the process of building democracy or democratization, which of course is sort of delayed in the East. In, in the West, you can say it starts after or, or resumes after World War II, and in, East, in the East, it is after 89. And then the process of Europeanization, which again starts in the West earlier, right after World War II, whereas in the East, only again after 89. Um, another issue that is very important is the link between the construction of memory and responsibility, which is the issue of transitional justice. And I think it forces us to think about three critical questions. Whose responsibility? Responsibility for what? And responsibility to whom? Responsibility for what? That forward question it puts us in the middle of a very complex set of issues. And um, after some thinking about it, I, I concluded that there are three potential objects of memory as related to the question of responsibility. Number one, fascist crimes, predomin predominantly the Holocaust. Number two, communist crimes. And number three, complicity of local populations, pronounced perhaps more in informal channels of, of memory coordination than in the formal channel of memory co coordination. People tend to say, it is not us, we, were, we are not doing anything wrong or anything bad. It is you. It's always kind of externalization of, of um, responsibility. Uh, each of those processes is, a, a pro is heavily uh, involved in, in the construction of common, um, uh, of various forms of, of common uh, collective uh, memory. <clears throat> The process of European integration formally begins, as, as we may all remember, with the foundation of the coal and steel community in 1952. So it's seven years after the end of World War II. However, the process of building common memory in the West starts right after the war. So it is already seven years earlier that people are beginning to think about the problems of common memory before the, the project of the European unification actually seriously institutionally uh, was initiated. Um, the process of building European memory, that's basically what I'm trying to say in this uh, slide, is sometimes seen as an issue of security, often as an issue of economic integration, but increasingly if you listen to various voices in the EU, you are beginning to hear we are either going to collapse or we will figure out tighter and deeper integration, which of course involves the questions of collective identity. And collective identity inevitably then asks for creating some form, or an attempt at least, to create a form of common uh, memory. We, we should be able to remember things somewhat in the, in the similar fashion in order to claim that we possess this thing called common identity. It is, as you know, extremely difficult, and actually, it's, at the moment, it seems to be getting more and more difficult. <clears throat> I will get to that in a moment. So what, what helps me, uh, helped me tremendously 
um, in the in the thinking about it is um, uh, Aleida Asman's very short piece on um, the various uh, stages of the formation or types really of the formation of of, of European uh, memory. So she, in this short article, um, follows the ideas proposed by Avishai Margalit in, in the influential book, The Ethics of Memory, from 2002. And she distinguishes four approaches. I would say we can use the idea of approaches and turn them into stages. It is very preliminary, but you will see how I'm trying to do that. So the stage number one, she calls dialogic forgetting. Immediately after the war, the idea is, well, we have so many issues, let's try to solve all those problems first, and let's put the questions of the memory of the Holocaust and all those horrible things um, on the back burner. Let's, let's kind of agree to forget together. Um, if we remember anything, it is two things people seem to be saying. The Germans are exclusively responsible, and if you were in Germany, it was the Nazis. And we, you know, not non-Germans or non-Nazis, we remember only our glorious resistant, resistance movements and our glorious sort of uh, past. This approach is dominant Germany, Austria, and France. And this sort of, this mnemonic equilibrium, uh, by all accounts, begins to unravel under the impact of the early trials of former assessment in Germany at the end of the 50s but most famously by Eichmann trials, uh, if you recall, the sentence came in 1962, so the beginning of, of the 60s. <coughs> this, this, it begins the beginning of the end of this phase, phase number one. Phase number two in uh, Aleida Asman's um, conceptualization is remembering in order to never forget. Remembering in order to never forget. Significance of 1968, the youth revolts, generational change, the new generation begins to ask the generation of parents, was it really not worth remembering? And if it was, uh, how, how was it? What, what was really going on? Um, a lot of people point out that uh, it is an interesting link, sort of globalization, impact of things that happen outside of Europe, uh, coming to the, the end of the Algerian war and the lost, the lost war in a sense, sense and, and it coincides with the beginning of thinking and talking about Vichy and the Vichy complicity. Um, a, a little bit later, uh, in the 70s, at the beginning of the 70s, the Holocaust begins to emerge as the key issue that we should try somehow to remember together. So this is, well, 25 years after, uh, a quarter of the century after the end of, of World War II. The third phase, uh, which is of interest to me because I, I work a lot on democratizations, is, comes actually as an idea associated with the third wave of democratizations in, in Huntington's phrase, uh, which you know usually is um, uh, um, uh, said to have begun in 1974 with Portugal and then it cascades to Spain and Southern Europe and then eventually 89 uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, and uh, the, the canonical, classical sort of um, institution that is associated with that phase or that type of remembering is truth commissions. And of course, as you know, the, the most famous is um, um, Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa as a model that various countries in various ways try to emulate with more or less success. It is about catharsis, about, about ritual ablution. Remember in order to forget in the long run. So now remember, let's work through that memory and then eventually we will be able to put it um, to rest. The fourth <clears throat> phase comes with the process of uh, expansion of European Union. Dialogic remembering, Aleida Asman calls it. Uh, uh, it is, uh, here is already a little bit of, of my own stuff, you know, thinking about this phase, what, what are the important elements? There's an acceleration of the process via which uh, uh, the Holocaust becomes the center of the European memory. In 1995, there's a very important resolution of the, or an act of the European Parliament 
In 2004, you have the enlargement of the EU, and you have the entrance of new countries with different official and unofficial memories. Uh, number three, I think what is really interesting is the, the, all of this happens where, when the process of globalization intens intensifies and the, the movement of people uh, increases dramatically, and you have the emergence of this phenomenon called long-distance nationalism. Uh, the nationals away from their own countries, and this is confirmed through a huge number of studies, tend to be more nationalistic than the people in the home country, and, and therefore, the, all these things that already were mentioned today about the link between the, the certain forms of denial about the things that are sort of ugly in the past is very much linked with the, this increased nationalism. <clears throat> and finally, there is the um, everybody begins to scrutinize everybody else. And uh, old roles prove to be inadequate. Now, the, the old roles, and this is very, I, I really like it in Asman's article, was it was this, the, the, the division of old roles. The heroic winner who conquered the evil, the resistance hero who actively resisted the evil, and the victim who passively suffered because of the evil. That is the old way of, of conceptualizing all of this. And now a new uh, role appears, which is the role of a co-author of the evil which may be you, you know, sometimes you may be a victim in one situation and the co-author of the evil in another situation. So uh, the mildest form of being co-author, now we are beginning to talk about, is uh, uh, passivity in the face of, of, of atrocity. Um, should we, and why didn't we, right, part do, do something? <clears throat> So this is this four uh, stages, um, if I can you know, expand her, her uh, modeling of those things. And, and here's what, what, what I uh, very quickly will show you. Don't, don't get scared by this. I will take it <laughs> through it. Very, you know, it is not to be remembered, but to <laughs> illustrate the main point. So in the left column, I put Western Europe according to the, um, the, the, the just tabulated the ideas I just shared with you. So you have those four stages, dialogic forgetting, remembering to never forget, a re related remember to trials, generation 68, then the third phase, remembering in order to forget, truth commissions, and finally you arrive after 2004 and at dialogic remembrance. The idea of Gulag versus Auschwitz appears. I will get to this idea in a second. Now, if you look, um, and I didn't have time. This is pre a preliminary study. Um, it will be very complicated if I will decide to do it country by country. Even Poland is too complicated. Mm -hmm. But so I, I decided to just as, as a preliminary illustration focus on Auschwitz and the memory of Auschwitz and the Holocaust. There's a lot uh, written about it, and there are pretty decent periodizations, studies on you know, how the memory of the Holocaust evolved in, in Poland um, over the, after 1945. And, and this is my, my best reconstruction. So first of all, you see there are many more stages. Right? This reflects the political history of Poland, which is much more volatile than the histories of the West after 45. Post-war, I call it a mnemonic chaos until 49. 49 is the beginning of Stalinism. So during Stalinism, the, the Auschwitz and the Holocaust, as remember, uh, 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 fascism is described as the precursor of or, or a symptom of Western imperialism. So now fascists, Germans, Americans, particularly, or Brits maybe a little bit also, are all put into one bag. And, and they are the perpetrators. And who suffers? You, you, you see it in the third box. This is mostly Poles. You know, I was born about 20 kilometers from Auschwitz. I remember I went there for this, uh, as, as a, a kid in a, a elementary school the first time. You come back, at the, you came back at that time, and you thought, "Well, this was horror," and who suffered? Poles, mm -hmm. but or Polish citizens, mm -hmm. right? So a kid, not only a kid, most people cannot make a distinction between the concept of Pole ethnic concept and Polish citizen. Um, Slowly, the internationalization of remembering begins to, to happen, and uh, the Jewish martyrology is finally being, uh, is, is, is slowly <laughs> emphasized, but it was 
mostly the Jews and not just Polish citizens. That happens in the 60s and the 70s. But then something really interesting happened, something that I've done some work on um, uh, earlier, which is the role of Catholicism in, in combating communism and after the fall of communism. It is the Christianization of the Auschwitz, Auschwitz memory. Um, John Paul II, who did a lot to create the reconciliation between the Jews and, and Catholics on many fronts, when he came to Auschwitz in 1979 during the visit that I at least argue is the beginning of the end of communism in some sense, but it's the beginning of solidarity movement in some sense. He called the Auschwitz the Golgotha of our age, which is obviously a, a kind of an, um, a rhetorical figure to, to Christianize the place. That continues after the fall of communism in 89. There is a, a, a very influential book by Genevieve Zubzitsky about the crosses of Auschwitz, where a, a nationalistic group uh, plants a crosses next to, or actually on the ground, which is for the Jews, a holy ground. It is clearly the ground where uh, uh, the Jews were buried. Um, this controversy lasted for quite a while. It was just atrocious. Eventually, the, the crosses were, were moved out. But it, the, what, what starts is the, the kind of uh, mnemonic war over that memory gain, which is now about uh, the Christian verse, version of remembering, but particularly Catholic, of remembering those things, and, and a v version which is increasingly dominant in Europe, which is, you know, sort of a Jewish, European, uh, global version. Um, and eventually, 2004, those countries enter, including Poland, um, European Union, and now they face a completely different political field and completely different set of um, sort of um, competitions over memory. Um, and in just in a nutshell, it is often referred to as Gulag versus Auschwitz, which is the memory of two totalitarianisms. Um, so um, w w what you have is, I, I will skip that slide, um, just don't want to take much more time. Um, um, but what you have, um, I, I'm not talking about things that are not, not on the uh, slide, is the competition between a part of Europe that is basically accustomed to thinking in terms of one totalitarianism, and we have to come to terms with one totalitarianism, and now you have those East Europeans who come in and say, hey, hold on, we have to remember two, right? So... Um, what was on the slide, just to quickly summarize, up to 2004, East, at least that was pretty clear, right, from this tabulation, you have many more periods. So the memory, the, the politics of memory, the history of the politics of memory is much more complicated. Um, and I will want to emphasize this point one more time. In the West, this process is consistently secular, often run by the bureaucrats from Brussels, in, in Eastern Europe, it is uh, increasingly uh, 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 religious, or religious elements are increasingly, particularly Catholic, impli impli implicated in the process. Um, and finally, this is the, the last thing. Um, so this is now about the cacophony in the East. Uh, so cultural space of Europe, like any other cultural space of a larger social political unit, needs to be built, you know, we can say manufactured. Um, and so since the uh, uh, state socialism collapse in 1989-91 in the former Soviet Union, you have the, this situation I just described. You have countries, on the one hand, wrestling with the memory of one totalitarianism, and then you have countries wrestling with the memory of two totalitarianisms. And one dis previously distorted, hol the Holocaust, and another forcefully silenced in the public sphere, though commemorialized privately, the, the Gulag. And the final thing, I will take you through this very quickly, step by step. So I'm going back to this idea that um, you have three objects of memory as it relates to the question of responsibility. You have the memory of Nazism and the Holocaust in particular. You have the memory of communism and the memory of complicity. So this is very preliminary, and I will very much, of course, welcome any, any criticisms and suggestions. But for now, let's, this is my 
hypotheses. So in Western Europe, by now, so I'm saying that to, after 2004, but let's say around 2015, around now, we have decisive condemnation of uh, Nazis and the Holocaust. About memory of communism, you have some ambivalence still. There is still a bit of a contents, uh, of course, sometimes surrounded around this kind of gruesome question, who suffered more and is the Holocaust, it is related to the grand question, is the Holocaust unique? Right? Or some people say, well, it, it may be not so, you know, Stalin, some people say, might have killed more people than Hitler, Mao killed even more than the two other combined, so they start this kind of st strange contest. Uh, but, but that's what's happening, that's the politics of it. And memory of complicity in the West by now, although it started very late, with great reluctance, is pretty advanced, I would say. Accounting is pretty advanced in the West. Now, in the East, you have three model-like situations. If you take Russia itself, and for obvious reasons we pay, again, a lot of attention to Russia, you have memory of Nazis and the Holocaust, decisive condemnation of both Nazism and and uh, Nazism yeah. as the, the source of the tragedy of the Holocaust. Uh, and when it comes to the memory of communists, to, to put it mildly, it is ambivalence and oscillation, right? And Putin actually, after Yeltsin, it was, the condemnation was being somewhat organized, the process of condemnation was moving forward under Yeltsin. Putin is reversing all of this, right? So there is no un unequivocal condemnation. Memory of complicity, it's almost impossible to start talking about it in several countries, in, including Russia, uh, it, when you look at the of official governmental policies. There are certain groups in the society, for example, the famous memorial group, that are trying to raise this issue, but right now the memorial is under siege mm -hmm. by the, the Putin administration. The second situation uh, uh, for me, because I know Latvia uh, relatively uh, well or, or better than, than quite a few other places, uh, 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 so the situation in this group, so let's call it the Latvian situation, memory of the Holocaust is ambivalence. There were, some of you may know, there were um, Latvian SS units, um, and uh, it is, you know, several years ago, I was walking through the streets of Riga. I was teaching there for a while at the university, and I came across the store, a small store in this beautiful old town Riga, which was selling uh, Nazi paraphernalia. You know, little guys with swastikas and this and that, and I just was shocked, right? So you have a, a lot of work. There are official, officially, the governments, the former presidents, condemned the Latvian complicity, but in, it really is a very slow process um, in terms of you know how deeply it penetrates the public sphere. Memory of communist decisive condemnation. This is one of the cornerstone of, of new Latvian identity. And in complicity, memory of complicity, there's a complete, I hope maybe not, maybe not complete, but in general there's a situation I would call the lack of decisive accounting. And finally, uh, situation um, uh, number three, um, uh, with this, that is, this is Poland. So when it comes to the memory of Nazis and the Holocaust, there is an enormous amount of work that's been done on this. Um, it, it, some of you may know uh, Jan Gross's books, an enormous debate, and two films actually, one The Aftermath and one Ida, which just won uh, the, the Oscar. Um, um, which are about those things. So th this is pretty advanced, and there's a lot of serious thinking, uh, both in academic circles, among the artists, among increasingly among the population. But still there is this kind of issue, I would say, with Polonization and Christianization. Th those th issues are not taught clearly sorted out. When it comes to memory of communism, you have s decisive condemnation of communism. But there is some critical revisionism, which I think is associated with the fact that Poland, is, as some people say, was the merriest barrack in the camp, which means that it was the, the least oppressive, maybe with Hungary, the, the, the least oppressive kind of communist country. So some people say, well, you know, don't exaggerate, it wasn't that bad, particularly, say, in the 70s. Um, of course, it was not that great under martial law of the 80s. <clears throat> but finally, the memory of complicity, I would say it is, compared with other countries, advanced accounting because of those things that I mentioned, particularly those films um, and uh, Jan Gross's books and all the stuff it is uh, that is surrounding this debate. Um, 
it is a, a, a serious debate. I mean, it is incredibly tough. There are people who obviously reject any, any thought of complicity, um, um, actually either by the right-wing Polish um, uh, groups uh, is denounced as an awful film that only won because the Jewish lobby controls Hollywood and things like that. But on the other hand, the movie is, is, incre is, is you know, by other groups, other circles, is praised and very well received. So that would lead me to this um, general assessment of advanced accounting. Um, that's all what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's very interesting to think of this in terms of phases, actually. Mm -hmm. To take the kinds of things you're talking about and think about it in East Asia is, is, is very interesting. Uh, uh, I, I'm sorry, I, I know, I'm not going to talk anyway now, so <laughs> it doesn't matter that you didn't hear me. Uh, Manan? So we're going to have Manan's, before we break, because of his schedule, we're going to ask to have Manan's uh, uh, comment. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Um, thank you, Carol, for the invitation. Um, it's, um, it's, it, it's really a privilege to be here. I, I, I'm not quite sure <laughs> how to begin. I mean, I guess I, I want to talk about a couple of things that I've picked up from uh, the remarks so, so far, and then I want to sort of speak about um, South Asia really briefly, because I think there are really interesting overlaps, but there are also ways in which we can complicate um, some of the things that we've been talking about. Um, just to um, sort of pick up on one of the points that Professor Yoshimi was making about uh, some of the revision, some of the pushback against your scholarship uh, um, in terms of that other militaries had their versions of comfort women, and so um, this sort of, and, and this also comes about in the some sense of the, you know, was the Holocaust, the, you know, this is sort of, sort of statistical um, um, equivalence that mm -hmm. people posit. And what it reminded me, of course, is that, um, not to get too meta about it, but there are uh, histories of forgetting in our critical historiography. So, for example, the notion that the British um, military, imperial mil colonial military in India, um, starting in 1855, maintained uh, brothels uh, and bordellos. Um, so there were 75 brothels in 1855 in uh, over 30 um, North Indian cities, um, each with 60 to 100 women who were kept there for um, sexual service of uh, the British military, and this is, of course, continues in uh, World War I, it continues in World War II, and so when we, when we start thinking about histories of nationalisms, uh, and they're coming to terms with um, World War II or, or post-World War II um, atrocities, what gets elided, what we forget, are the histories of imperial um, concerns which which actually both in terms of infrastructure but also in terms of shaping what it means for uh, the body and the archive are, are really crucial so I, I just wanted to put that on the um, as well on the table um, the the remarks by professor young and kubik I, I you know I think they're they're both um, really informative of course uh, first of all um, but I wanted to sort of pick up on um, two facts of personal life that both of you mentioned in terms of your places of birth and how you know you mentioned uh, the, the, uh, how near you were to Auschwitz and, mm -hmm. and how you uh, saw that space and and um, in terms of um, Nanjing um, I'm a historian who's perhaps obsessed by thinking through space and thinking about the relationship that space has on cultural memory and it has on our um, project of remembrance and forgetting, and my, my work is um, largely about that. And I, I wanted to offer sort of two models through which I have tried to think about <coughs> the question of memory. One is a model that we've heard uh, in, in all three presentations, um, which I would just call the constructive project. And this is... Um, a national project, this is a communal project, this is a cultural memory project, but this is a project that constructs a, a particular 
um, effect, and we saw textbooks, uh, we saw National Memorial Museums, we saw all kinds of production that, that are iterative, um, they are genealogic in a particular way, and, and they build upon um, a lot of sort of um, mutually constitutive arguments, right? You can't have a good citizen of a space mm -hmm. if that good citizen ha is indicted for uh, raping and killing, right? So you, know, you can't construct an ideal citizen of the nation state if that ideal citizen can also be uh, implicated in violence. And against that, the project that we haven't talked much about, but I do want to say some things about, is the deconstructive project. Mm -hmm. And the deconstructive project, um, I think I lost it. I think you lost it too. I don't know why. Maybe the batteries are now. Batteries? Mm -hmm. I can, uh, I can speak. No. Okay. It is? Try this one, Mama. <laughs> right. You'd think we'd be able to do this, but we can't. Uh, does this work? Yes. Yeah. Right, thank you. It happens everywhere. So um, I wanted to actually sort of take a few minutes to talk about this deconstructive project. And, um, I, and I am sort of relying on the, the work of Jacques Derrida and the archive and body to sort of think through some of these issues because in the deconstructive process project, um, our point of arrival is the body. It is the woman as a subject of violence, both through history and through the national project. And it is deconstructive precisely because it cannot be located so easily in a textbook. It cannot be located so easily in national communal memories. Um, and it destabilizes both the, uh, the effort to recuperate and the effort to forget. And I was born in the city of Lahore, which mm -hmm. in 1947 uh, exchanged populations as a part of the partition of uh, India and Pakistan. And I want to, my grandmother uh, kept on her body, uh, keeps on her body, a set of keys which belonged to the house that she left in Kashmir when they came to um, Lahore. And as a child, um, I played with those keys, thinking that they were the keys to the house that I grew up in. And it was only uh, much later, um, I was about 10 to 10 or 11 years old, when she, <coughs> um, in some offhand way in a kitchen, said that, no, that these keys are not for this house. These keys to, are to a house that I can never return. And I want to uh, mark that moment of um, sort of the violence of which I hesitantly, but just for the just just for this talk, we'll, we'll bracket as a state-less violence, um, because this is the formation of two states, and the violence that my grandmother is remembering is a violence that she does not locate in a state body, right? She does not say that the state of X or Y is responsible. She, it's, a, it's, a, it's a violence that is um, in her memory, that is locatable in a geography, in a space, but there is no particular other for her to argue through. And the 1947 projects of remembering in the constructive project way um, have tackled uh, 1947's partition in precisely these, in these ways. So they have, there are projects that sort of recuperate movements of people. There are projects that focus on nostalgic uh, remembrances of Delhi or, or Lahore or other key cities. And there are projects that um, sort of it, you know, in today's world, uh, in, in terms of geopolitical, you know, the, the um, sort of trying to foster greater friendship between the two nations, Aman Kiyasha, etc. These are NGO oriented projects. That's where their emphasis is. Their emphasis is to say the violence here is the violence of partition itself, the violence of uh, separation of people, places, and the question of the sexual violence, the rapes or the, uh, the, the uh, killings that actually um, were part of this process of uh, migration and, and separation are subsumed, right? You don't, you don't really focus that much on those issues. That was, um, we, we can sort of unanchor the violence and the partition and we can focus on the, on the partition. On the, uh, partition. 
And against mm -hmm. this, I want to think about um, the moment of 1971. So 1947's partition uh, created Pakistan, which was itself a geographically separated country, con constituting of two wings, East Pakistan and West Pakistan. East Pakistan and West Pakistan um, were, um, had, um, were separated by over 1,200 miles, and the, India was in, the, in, in, in between these two wings. In 1971, there was a civil war, and in the civil war, the Pakistani military, um, by some accounts, was responsible for over two million deaths um, in uh, putting down, trying to put down this uh, secessionist movement, um, or characterize it as a secessionist movement, and uh, was responsible for uh, a lot of sexual violence um, and uh, destruction, which sort of creates the 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 current state of Bangladesh. The violence of Bangladesh, which is a violence of state on its citizen, so these are Pakistani army um, targeting women of, their, uh, of East Pakistan um, and enacting a regime of, um, on, on a horrific mass scale. This violence um, and Pakistan uh, army state's own culpability um, is erased <laughs> through the constructive project that happens post-1971 in Pakistan, which basically has seen a series of military dictatorships, uh, each lasting over a decade until, until about 2008. And so you, you have no space within which, uh, and this is me as a, again, as someone who grew up in Lahore in the, in the mid-70s and 80s, uh, who went to the state school uh, and never heard a word about Dhaka, never heard a word about this violence um, that was enacted in... in um, um, and so, to the point of this, this constructive approach, uh, the historian's task, the task of the historian to go to the archive and demonstrate this violence having taken place, um, was done by um, historians in Bangladesh, not historians in Pakistan. The historians in Bangladesh and in the United States, uh, historians who have sort of uh, went through this archive, um, found evidence of massacres, found evidence of, of rapes, and documented it and presented it, produced a silence in the Pakistani state. Right? There is no official response. There is no projects, such as some of these projects that um, uh, Professor Kubik has sort of laid out. But against that, um, I do want to say something about the deconstructive project. So if we look at the constructive project pr perspective, it's just silence, and there's nothing that we can say, and, and, and you know, Pakistan's particular memorialization or Bangladesh's particular memorialization seem to sort of um, be not a part of this conversation that we are having here today. But I would argue that actually in the Deconstructors uh, project, where when we begin this conversation from the archive of, of the body and we, we think through how particular uh, ways in which testimony is utilized um, to reconstruct the past, to, uh, to assert um, agency, um, we, can, we can see ways in which Pakistan um, is trying to, uh, the, the cultural memory of Pakistan is shifting. And here, I'm sorry to sort of bring so much of my own personal um, memories in here, but um, in 1976, a, a letter, we received a letter in our, in our home in Lahore, and the letter was from Taka, and it was, a, it was addressed to uh, one of my uncles, who had a small business in Taka, um, you know, small anything, and he invested in some shop. Um, and the letter was a plea for more funds, right? So the shop um, owner in Dhaka had written a letter to Lahore and said, hey, we were partners, you invested this much, times are bad, <laughs> I need some more investment. The letter sort of sat. Um, I don't think my uncle ever replied. I'm, I'm not sure what happened to it. It was just sat in some, some drawer for a very, very long time um, until um, 
in 2013 when I was visiting uh, Lahore, I found it. Um, as I mean, I'm, it wasn't a discovery, just literally. You know, in a <laughs> um, and as I was reading through this letter, um, something was actually happening in Shahbag, in Dhaka. And this was the, the, the what, what, what are, I think, known now as the Shahbag uh, uh, mm-hmm. uh, protests. There, which, which are the result of the sort of a, a type of truth and reconciliation project in Bangladesh to bring to justice collaborators, collaborators, uh, bang, collaborators who um, assisted um, the Pakistani army and then joined the state and, so, and were part of the state for the next 30 or 40 years. And uh, it was against the conviction of one of these key figures and his supporters and those who uh, were calling for such uh, truth and uh, uh, trials that collapsed in this public square, Shahbag, in, in 2013, and this, this event uh, lasted for over a month and, and is perhaps one of the most singular events after the Harir Square, though I'm, it hasn't received that kind of an attention from the scholarly world. But part of the Shabak tribunal uh, uh, trials that, as it was happening, was were the stories of the Birangana women, women who were, um, you know, we can sort of who were the, the victims of rape and who kept their silence, but were coming out with testimonies in the 80s and 90s, and then as part of the Shabak trial, they became a central figure. To assert the the evil the evil that pa- Pakistani army did. So the accounts of the testimonies of the Birangana women, who have been kept silent because of this, because they didn't fit the cultural the constructive project. Even even when Bangladesh asserted that it did not want um, that it um, was the wrong party, it did not use the testimony of these women to make that case because hearing their voices was um, a mark of shame to this, uh, um, uh, to this understanding. Um, Shabag was happening. I had friends who were in Dhaka who were there every day, and they would send me um, sort of things on WhatsApp and text messages of, of images, of songs, of uh, projects where uh, testimonies, public testimonies was, were being collected. And uh, in, in this weird way, the letter that I was holding in my hand, um, the address was in Shabar. And, and that was a moment, personally, as a historian, that I realized how much of the constructivist approach to thinking about trauma as somewhere else, or thinking about trauma through textbooks or through national memorialization projects, um, heights. Um, the very, very intimate violences that are part of these um, projects of recuperation or projects of uh, remembrances. And the effort in Pakistan, Bangladesh, India, uh, we can say collectively by historians over the last 20 years has been on the constructivist end. We have a lot of histories that sort of look at the ways in which the Pakistani state manufactures uh, a past, or the Indian state, or the Bangladesh state, uh, or Bangladesh culture writ large does this. What we do not have are the deconstructivist uh, projects for thinking about it. And I just want to give one last example, and then I'll, I'll, I'll beg your indulgence, is the one of the key poets that is a is a huge part of the sort of left-leaning and left sensibilities of Pakistan intelligentsia um, is Faz Ahmed Faz, who was, a, uh, who, you know, who was a sort of target of military, um, the, the target of mil- uh, uh, military rulers. Um, he was a uh, communist um, and a, uh, you know, someone who um, was admired by. Uh, a huge swath of our world, including Edward Said, who, who wrote about him. Um, Faz Ahmed Faz in 1971 um, was, um, you know, already, I think, 70 years old, and uh, 
and known around the world for his poetry, for speaking about the peasant, for resistance. When Dhaka, uh, when the Pakistani army retreated from Dhaka, he wrote a poem um, that month, in December 1971. Um, that poem I read again as a child, and I've continued to sort of work through some of, some of the implications of how to read this simple poem. The, the poem's uh, first um, verse, I'll, I'll just say what it is. Hum ke thare ajnabi kitni mulaqaton ke baad. We who, we who became strangers after how many meetings. So that's the first refrain, and it sort of goes through this, this ways in which um, two people, lovers in this, in this poem, cannot see each other again and become strangers. If you, if you don't know the title of the poem, you would imagine that this is a poem of two people who fall in and out of love. However, the title of the poem is the, is the part where um, I think um, we, can, we can see the constructivist approach um, highlighted perhaps most explicitly. The title of the poem is Sakut e Dhaka. Um, Sakut is a funny word. Um, closest English for Sakut would be fall. So if in English translations of this poem, you will see the title as the fall of Taka. Right? Fall is a sort of a passive, passive term. You, know, you fall, you slip, fall. It's okay. Unless it's the Roman Empire, in which case you have seven boys. <laughs> but Sakut is not fall, necessarily. Sakut is snatched. Mm -hmm. It's to be taken. And to me, as a, as a historian, reading the taking of Taka as a story of two lovers implicates even this very liberal communist poet in the nationalist project who is, the, you know, he was at the other end of the state. He's a, he's a person who is, who is in exile uh, for most of his life. And yet, in exile, against the state, he cannot see the violence of Taka outside of this. And, I, and that are the frameworks in the constructivist project that I think, um, as historians, as anthropologists and social scientists who are trying to think about the project of memory, memory making, we need to be especially attuned to, to especially be careful and, and, and in our uh, approaches. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. You have to leave at 12, is that right? Yes. Okay. So I, I think we'll take our break now and we'll come back and have um, Il Danielli's comment. So, but a short break, please, 10 minutes. There's, uh, there's help yourself to whatever's left. But please come back it, timely because. Um, okay. Um, I'd like to start. Um, I, Professor Ahmed has to go, had to, to go to teach a class, but if you have comments about what he said, I promise that I would convey them to, to him. Uh, now we'd like to hear the comment from, uh, from Dr. Danielli, and then we'll have discussion. Uh, they say this microphone is better. Thank you. And I'm not going to speak about, uh, about the work that you have distributed in front of you. Uh, but I thought you would want to have this framework. If we have a chance in the discussion, we might. Do you that hear me? Better. I switched no. it, so. <laughs> Do you hear me now? Any better? Yeah, right, 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 <laughs> right to the Please. face. Okay. Because you won't be able to be heard. <laughs> well, you didn't do that to my Um... I began my work on trauma. I actually lived through trauma, uh, being born uh, during World War II and through seven other wars in Israel, and, uh, and through having my childhood literally embraced and embracing 
of survivors of the Holocaust and the building of the State of Israel. So, uh, and it's important for you to also know, uh, my mother was born in Poland. It's now Ukraine. Uh, and my father in Vienna. So you can see already that, uh, like very many of us, we are children of history. And you cannot not know that, even if you don't consciously know that. So it might not be in your conscious mind, it might be in your body, it might be in the way you respond to things. So let me, rather than, uh, rather than address some of the points that the speakers brought up, I, which moved me a great deal, I have worked with, with some of the comfort women to help them speak in the, in the early days. Uh, I've visited China and Nigeria, for that matter, and many other places. I, uh, I had in the 60s, the 60s, 70s, the dubious honor of building the first program to help Nazi Holocaust survivors and their children. The way the project began was that I was doing my doctorate at NYU on the psychology of hope. I was already a multidisciplinarian because I used the phenomenological method from philosophy, etc. Um, and uh, I, was a, I was teaching at Brooklyn College, so my, my students were part of, part of the interviewing uh, process, and everybody I knew was. Uh, I, they interviewed people as to what I thought would be minimal, manageable challenge to hope like missing a bus. They learned very fast that there is no minimal challenge to hope because sometimes you miss a bus and you could lose your career uh, and such things. They learned a lot. And I took on um, my divorce students, interviewed divorce people, etc., etc., disabled. Uh, I took on the, what seemed the most difficult at the time, uh, which was concentration camp survivors, POWs or prisoners of war, and uh, remember in the 60s people still haven't spoken about that, and, and uh, terminally, terminally diagnosed patients. Uh, I can tell you amazing stories from that dissertation. Uh, but also I must tell you that I took on another dissertation because uh, while all my professors said, you know, these people don't talk to anybody, why should they talk to you? Uh, I would custom, and I believe in studying uh, where people are rather than in my lab or in my office only. Um, typically, however, I would go to survivors' homes, for example, and I'll speak only about survivors of the Holocaust because I want to share my theory with you for this discussion. Uh, typically, I would go to survivors' homes uh, after work. Uh, those of you who might know the style of living, you know they would put me in the kitchen. And uh, those people who, who were supposed to never talk to anybody and to wouldn't talk to anybody, very often kept me there until the next day. It was as if they were waiting all these years to speak to someone who would listen. Uh, what they said to me, and that was a, a, a rather um, stunning finding, 100% of them, without exception, said that no one would wanted to listen to them or would listen to them or believe them. including lawyers, mental health professionals. Now, I was a very idealistic graduate student, and it broke me as a graduate student of psychology that people who had suffered so very much uh, were not taken care of by professionals who, whose job and contract is to listen 
and to take care of them. So uh, I, I always joke and I say, well, uh, as a researcher, I, uh, what do you do when you're outraged? You do research. <laughs> So I changed my doctoral dissertation, although there are publications on the psychology of hope, to trying to understand the conspiracy of silence that existed between society and Holocaust survivors about their Holocaust experiences since the end of World War II. And we, we don't even want to go to, to the conspiracy of silence during the war. Of course, they suffered from that too. Uh, as, as did everybody we have been speaking about today. Um, uh, I, I cannot, we, I don't have the time to, get, to take you through the, the, the methodology or any of it, but I can share with you that I found 49 ways of not listening. <laughs> we are experts in not listening to survivors of mass trauma. Uh, and, and, and of course, this immediately ties in with many of the comments before me. So I figured I'll sort of tie it into the development of my own thinking rather than pick on points. Uh, uh, and of course, as a clinician, I built a project to help survivors. And as an advocate, I've advocated since, and successfully so, with many colleagues, to create all international instruments on behalf of victims. So I've written more laws than most lawyers. Uh, uh, and that goes to the ICC, all the, all the provisions for victims in the ICC, but also prior, all the, all the building blocks until then, and actually since then. And, and I have a whole body of work in, on what I call reparative justice, where justice is not only retributive, but also reparative and not only in the sense of compensation, but in the sense of the, pro the, the justice process that is teaching judges, te teaching investigators, etc., how to listen to victims. It is very painful to listen to victims. It, it, it has effects, not, it, it has very uh, profound effects on the listener. And in effect, I. I created a, a whole body of work on that too, on what in, in psychology is called counter-transference, but it's really the listener's re response to listening. So by the way, it, to add to one of the comments you made, it's not just the survivor who is ready to speak maybe, it's really whether the world is ready to listen. When I was working with, with Devon Tutu in the TRC, and he was so proud that the victims are speaking and, and that they had, you know, on Sunday from 7 to 8 uh, in the evening on television, they had the hearings <laughs> of the trials, not the trials, the processes of the TSC. Um, he was very proud that it was on TV and I said, but do, are you measuring if people are listening? See, because for me, just for the victim to speak, uh, it could be in a, in a black hole. It could be in an empty room. For the victim's testimony to, to change history, to change society, to change politics, the victim must be heard. And we as a society, moral society, must create conditions for the victims to speak. Okay, so we are talking in everything we say, we are really talking about multidimensional interactions. Okay, let me, uh, so I have a whole body of things about the conspiracy of silence. Those of you who are interested, you have my email, you know, on this page, which is the idea of it, just email me and I will correspond. But I want to go now to tell you very briefly my, the, the bare bones of my theory of trauma. That, Okay, so uh, it's called the trauma and the continuity of self, a multidimensional, multidisciplinary, integrative framework. The attempt to delineate and encompass the nature and extent of the destruction of catastrophic massive trauma, which is what we are talking about today, having to account for the different contextual dimensions and levels of it, and the diversity in and in response to it, 
dictate the, the formulation of this theory. The framework will thus help guard against reductionistic impulse to find unidimensional explanations for such complex phenomena. You would recognize that underlying each of these dimensions that I'm going to specify, there is a distinct philosophical view of the nature of humankind that informs what the professional thinks and does. So when we get together, historians, psychologists, anthropologists, lawyers, etc., each one of us comes with a different ima rich image of humanity that, and, 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 and which can enrich our dialogue, but makes it more complex and more difficult. Because sometimes we really don't know what we are talking about. We think we do. We have a conversation. But <laughs> OK. An individual's identity involves a complex interplay of multiple spheres or systems. Among these are the biological, the intrapsychic, the interpersonal, that is familial, social, communal, the ethnic, cultural, re ethical, religious, spiritual, natural, the educational, professional, occupational, the material, economic, legal, environmental, political, national, and international. Again, you know all of this, but it has to, to be put in front of us. Each dimension may be a subject of one or more disciplines, which may overlap and interact, such as biology, <coughs> psychology, sociology, economics, law, anthropology, religious studies, and philosophy. These systems dynamically coexist <coughs> along the time dimension to create a continuous conception of life from past through present to future. Ideally, the individual should simultaneously have free psychological access and movement within all of these identity dimensions. So if you can sort of envision internally an elevator shaft, it simply moves, right? Both in width and, and, in, uh, and from past to present to future and down. Uh, exposure, if you visualize it, exposure to trauma causes a rupture, a possible regression, and a state of being stuck in this free flow, which I have called fixity. The time, this is the whole field of trauma right now, the time, duration, extent, and meaning of the trauma for the individual the survival mechanisms or strategies utilized to adapt to it, as well as post-victimization traumata, variously described as the conspiracy of silence, the second wound, the third traumatic sequence, cutoff, homecoming stress. These are different disciplines talking about the same phenomenon. That is what happens after the trauma, presumably after liberation, after everything is the bad finished. They will determine the elements and degree of rupture, the disruption, disorganization and disorientation, and the severity of the fixity. The fixity may render the individual vulnerable, particularly to further trauma ruptures throughout the life cycle. This framework allows evaluation of whether and how each system was ruptured or proved resilient, and may thus inform the choice of optimal systemic interventions. For example, the Nazi Holocaust not only ruptured continuity, but also destroyed all the individual's existing support. The ensuing pervasive conspiracy of silence between survivors and societies including mental health professionals, deprive them and their children of potential supports. And that is true for everything we spoke about today. You heard every speaker mention it. <coughs> Integration of the trauma must take place in all of life's relevant dimensions of systems and cannot be accomplished by the individual alone. <coughs> Routes to integration may include uh, the list of tasks I gave you on the page, okay? And you can see I organized it from the individual standpoint, 
from the from the <coughs> societal standpoint, from the national and international. Okay, and uh, the the major lesson to understand from all of this is that no element to redress trauma in itself can, quote, take care of it, can resolve it. All of the elements are needed. Uh, so I'm, uh, the, uh, we have short time, and it's, I don't want to, to take too much of it because I want, I'm more interested in the discussion. <coughs> Uh, so you, let me jump immediately to the, no, let me just say that systems can change and recover independently of other systems. For example, there may be progress in the social system, but not in the political system. While there can be isolated, independent recovery in various systems or dimensions, they may also be related and independent, interdependent. For example, Matusek, a German researcher, found that survivors of the Holocaust in the US, United States, and Israel have been more successful in coping with their concentration camp past <coughs> than in Germany, which for them is still the country of their persecutors. And I can again speak of every point for a whole week, so. But let me move to, to what seemed to me very relevant to today's discussion, which is the intergenerational context. Because you're talking about multiple generations. The intergenerational perspective reveals the impact of trauma, its contagion, and repeated patterns within the family or society or nation. It may help explain certain behavior patterns, symptoms, roles, and values adapted by family members, family sources of vulnerability as well as resilience and strength, and job choices through the generation. Viewed from a family system perspective, what, happened in one, what happens in one generation will affect, affect what happens in the older or younger generation. When you lose a child, it affects you very deeply. So don't forget that intergenerational goes backwards and forwards. Within an intergenerational context, the trauma and its impact may be passed down as the family legacy. Again, whenever I say family, think society, think nation, think community. The, the legacy. Uh, is passed as the family legacy, etc., even to children born after the trauma, right? You heard Anand mention it. He was a real example right here. In response to some trends in the literature to pathologize, overgeneralize, and or stigmatize survivors and children of survivors of the Holocaust-related phenomena, as well as differences emerging between the clinical and research literature, I have emphasized the heterogeneity of adaptation among survivors and their families. That is, the message is not everyone responds the same way, even when you look from the outside and you simplistically expect that. Several studies have have empirically validated my own descriptions of at least four different, differing post-war, what I call adaptational styles of survivors and survivor families. And I named them the victim families, fighter families, <coughs> numb families, and families of those who made it. This family typology illustrates lifelong and intergenerational transmission of Holocaust traumata, the conspiracy of silence, and their effects. Uh, I mentioned before to Carol that after all these years, I mean, I, I wrote about this in the 70s and 80s, and after all these years having waited for people to create a measure uh, <laughs> 
that would be relevant to survivors. Uh, when I was actually asked at the advent of the internet by people from, from Cambodia, from South Africa, from anywhere, please, we want to study this in our own population, but our doctoral uh, uh, professors don't let us because there is no measure. And I kept saying, okay, I created all the knowledge, go make a measure. And they were too intimidated because when we started, there were, they were like five books. And now there are thousands for good and for bad. So um, at age of retirement, I started a new career as a scientist. And uh, we created, after the last three years, we created a valid standardized measure for assessing uh, survivorship and intergenerational transmission. Uh, that is finally being published, so I'm so happy to share that with you because, and, and, to, and to suggest that in all the populations you're working with, uh, it, it should be <coughs> tested to see if it's applicable. I suspect that there will be not only historical differences, but cultural differences, uh, which would be very interesting to actually study rather than believe in mm -hmm. or, or cite. Uh, the family is a carrier of conscious and unconscious values, myths, fantasies, and beliefs that may not be shared by the larger community or culture. Yet the role of the family is a vehicle for intergenerational transmission of core issues of living and of adaptive as well as maladaptive ways of defining and coping with them may vary among cultures. The awareness of the possibility of pathogenic intergenerational processes and the understanding of the mechanisms of transmission should contribute to our finding effective means for preventing their transmission to succeeding generations. The identity dimensions contained in the framework I mentioned also serve as pathways for intergenerational transmission. Different cultures capitalize on different pathways to acculturate their young. Thus, beyond the familial, from parents to offspring, entire bodies of human endeavors are vehicles of transmission. Oral history, literature and drama, <coughs> history and politics. We were today primarily talking about history and politics. But if you go to Serbia and listen and understand the language and listen to the songs they sing and they teach in school and to the sermons, you, you worry that the next war is ready to happen, for example. Uh, so history, politics, religious ritual and writings, cultural traditions, and the study thereof, such as anthropology, etc. And of course, beyond their psychosocial implications, multi-generational effects of trauma may carry legal, right? Issues of compensation and restitution, uh, the creation of the International Criminal Court that was mentioned, and political, that is cycles of violence, ethnic and racial strife, and such implications. I promised, uh, You, a surprise. You? Well, hurry, yes. hurry up because I'm you're hurrying. running out of time I'm for hurrying. surprises. Go ahead. Do you know that uh, Abe's maternal grandfather... Oh, this is for Yoshimi-sensei. Go ahead. <laughs> well, no, no, it's related. Huh? It's Abe's maternal grandfather uh, was a ruler uh, in in Manchukuo. Not a surprise. All right. And <laughs> and <laughs> Xi Jinping's grandfather was a resistance communist leader. Or so I studied. His father. His father. His father. Well. So uh, I just figured I'll throw it throw it at the discussion because I, it was just too good to, to not mention it. Okay. 
but I'm sure that, uh, you know, part of at the UN, what we try to do, for example, we would, I said, you know, let's look at the globe. <laughs> let's predict the next war. <coughs> it's not very difficult. <coughs> but Well, on that happy thank note, you. thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, we, we, we really need to have our discussion now, so thank you very much. Uh, the floor is open. Yes. And, and, you, and please talk Scream. kindly. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I have one comment and one question. They're both interrelated, and it goes to a little louder even. Professor Kubik. Uh, thank you very much for the just exposition between the politics of memory in Western Europe and in Eastern Europe, where in Western Europe is one totalitarianism that is remembered, centering around Holocaust. I find it appeal, uh, appalling how communism is seen as anomaly for Eastern Europe, uh, for uh, the European Union. It's seen as an anomaly because it prevented the countries from their natural flow of being, of being within the capitalist world. And when I, when I look at the EU policies in Eastern Europe in terms of politics of memory, it has produced such strange things in terms of what Eastern European, I mean, I'm especially interested in former Yugoslavia, but also in Southeastern Europe in general, what they produce. So in, in Slovenia, for instance, and in, 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 in Zagreb, in Croatia, uh, you have a go back to the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, right? In, in Greece, uh, you have go back to antiquity after Alexander the Great. In Albania, you go back to fascist Italy in order <laughs> to prove the, the civilatory mission, right? So th these are the policies of the European Union that have created this very weird <coughs> post-socialist sphere of, um, of coming together. And this relates to my other, to my question, which is, can we think of bringing together the East Asian space and the Eastern European one beyond, I mean, in, in the politics of memory that goes beyond violence, beyond trauma, beyond suffering. And I have something very specific in mind here when I ask this, and this goes back to this, regarding communism as an anomaly, uh, in terms of, let's see, China's implications within the Eastern European communists. I mean, these, these are spheres that are not really explored. So is there a way we can talk about the politics of memory and bringing together these spaces that go beyond suffering and violence? I think that's something for you, <laughs> Professor Kubik, and for you. So do you want to start? Well, I, I will try. Um, I, I'm not sure if I understand the, the, the question. It's more, it's more like a comment, mm -hmm. right? But um, <clears throat> the commune is this anomaly. Let me start with that. Um, well, it uh, depends who is constructing the memory of communists, right? It's not, some people think about it as anomaly. Some people do not. So um, the, it has very serious repercussions if you think about it as an anomaly and I, I think you outlined it properly that then you're looking into the time prior to communism and you idealize it usually so this is this kind of paradise lost paradigm um, um, with you know which is often has nothing to do with the re reality as it is reconstructed professionally by historians um, uh, but it, you know, it's a myth of some kind that, that um, it has very uh, strong influence on how people position themselves, how they remember communism itself. Um, I, I am not, not sure uh, about the European Union. Um, uh, if you said something, a fear of coming together. I, I, who, whose fear, actually? Who, who is fearful of coming together? And, because I'm not sure if I understood. I didn't say fear of coming together, but I see a general tendency of the experience of communism being locked in the museums of communism that then are consumed by Western tourists, right? I mean, they're supposed to come in and, uh, and go into these museums because they're not really made for the local people to actually talk and discuss communism. And it seems like the European Union itself is, has been pushing a lot of funds and money in developing these public spaces uh, for, for tourism industry, for instance. Right? 
I, 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 are you from Yugoslav, former Yugoslavia, from some countries from Yugoslavia? From Yugoslavia, but I also know in Albania, right? But, but because, you, you know, in our book, we, we, we have a very, uh, you know, we, the, our book is a comparative study of 17 cases with country experts in it. And uh, the, the, the chapter on uh, Serbia and, and Croatia, which is mostly what, what it is about, shows a, a, a something really interesting that it, it basically the idea was, because the book is about the me memory of the fall of communism, right? So it's 20 years after, you know, how the fall, the actual fall, 89, is remembered. And what comes from the former, uh, the countries that once constituted uh, uh, Yugoslavia is, forget about it. This is not really interesting. This doesn't happen, doesn't touch us. 89 is not about us, which has something to do with the trauma of war that happens right immediately afterwards. But, you know, it is really, really interestingly different from the way it is remembered in other countries. So there is no memory of communism. You know, the, 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 there's memory of particular communisms in each country. In each country, the story is different, and it's filtered through the way, the, the you know, the, the, tra the trajectory, a specific trajectory of a country happened from 45 to 89. Um, that's the, one of the main conclusions of our book. We didn't expect that. So what you're describing is actually, which, we, which was recognized in the book, that you know, the, in former Yugoslavia, a lot of those ceremonies were created by German foundations mm -hmm. and, and by organizations of EU, but it's not the case for other countries. I, I don't want to take more time, but, but you know, so diversity is the, 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 that's what we see. There's no one pattern. Well, we can talk more about it, because um, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't want to take more time. All right, and any connection between, uh, on this communist question, you probably could answer it just the way he did, <coughs> the connection between China, China's communist past and these other communist Well, past. I mean, in China, it's not a communist past, it's a communist exactly. present. Exactly. So uh, <laughs> that does raise the question. You cannot right. put that in the same kind of, say, Museum of Terror as in right. Budapest, where you, know, you essentially put Holocaust <laughs> and the communist rule in the same box. Um, so yeah, give me an opportunity to maybe uh, add to my earlier presentation. Namely, in China, there's more than one trauma to remember. Of course. To be sure. And uh, it so happened, uh, I taught a course on memory uh, violence uh, in modern Asia. And then we look at one violence after another one per week, and my students get so traumatized <laughs> exactly. in the semester. But to be more uh, serious, uh, we, we selected the book, uh, uh, The Tombstone, which dealt with the famine in China, the number that was mentioned by Maham, that uh, more people died uh, in that famine than any other human-induced famine uh, in world history. So in, in this sense, to add to what I said earlier, the memory of World War II, from an official perspective, definitely is used in a way to kind of uh, push out other competing memories of more recent trauma. So actually, going back to your question, uh, you said after the end of the trauma itself, it's whereas not the, there's in no China, end. <laughs> it's, it's much more exactly. complicated. No, I was actually arguing that liberation is not the end of, of anything. Sometimes it is for the, for the peace, peace signers, but not for people. Yeah. But also <laughs> go to the point of going beyond this official memory, there are indeed some efforts of individual, individuals even seeking forgiveness of what they've done during the Cultural Revolution, what they've done to former teachers or mm -hmm. others. But uh, that tends to be much more under the radar screen. May I add one thing? No, no. no, then, <laughs> no let's let's no, get, because no. we're short on time. So let's get some more questions and then. Yes, Mark. Commenting on this question, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, there's, there's trauma and there's agony, and there's trauma and there's agony. Uh, that's life. It's all about trauma. But I'm struck by the difference between uh, the European communist countries and, uh, and the East Asians. So let me, let me concentrate on China in this for a moment. And, and the, the crucial difference, of course, is that uh, East uh, Europe got communism as a gift, so to speak, from the Soviet Union. Uh, and Chinese communism, Vietnamese communism, Korean communism comes out of national liberation struggles. 
So lots of killing in both in both cases, but the opportunity for constructing the Chinese memory by the state, but not only the state. Lots of opportunity for many people to remember very positively the national liberation struggle, the defeat of Japan, the building of the country, how you build a strong country. Well, it, you know, the, the Japanese government has the temerity to say that, uh, that we are what we are thanks to our war effort. But the Chinese uh, and the Vietnamese really do say this, and they really mean it, and it has, it has a certain meaning to it. So, um, so violence and trauma that, you know, nobody suffered more than the Chinese, well, maybe the Russians did, no. In that war, nevertheless, is a foundation for a different kind of, of memory, and not just transcending, not just communism is all bad. Well, then the, the question becomes more complicated, because as Da Ching has pointed out, there are, there are a lot of other things that happen later. Uh, traumas associated with the new government. So, um, I, you know, I think we can say that the government's strength is its ability to build on a nationalism that's linked to former traumas and say, yeah, we were the people who made what we have now possible. Okay, I, I, I hope someone in this room can answer the question about why so much of these both state and what you call secular memories in terms of national identity are built on suffering and victimhood and trauma when they have long histories to choose other things from? I mean, this to me is a philosophical question, maybe it's yeah, a psychological it's question, uh, but the fact is that, that China has you know, as it will tell you, 5,000 years of history. Um, and to, to, so uh, it's a question that I, I hope some of you would think about, which is how, why it's trauma and suffering, even if it's for a heroic, in your case, a heroic positive view, why it should be the century of humiliation, why it should be the victimization rather than other possible pasts. Anyway, um, yes, okay. But uh, one of the reasons is that if you focus on I'm a victim, you don't have to think of having been perpetrator. That's one of the 49 uh, ways of not speaking. <laughs> So, uh, I, of course, you can yeah. do the other way around, but, too. But that's so. a psychological reason, and it's also well, a reason where you, that you're right. It also focuses on not being a collaborator. And it gives you a moral stature. Yeah. Yeah. You know, presumably, have, if you suffered, it, it depends whether you are Christian or Jewish or Muslim. Yeah. But in different religions, having suffered gives you a moral stature and authority that uh, you wouldn't have otherwise. Uh, can I just jump on this note? Um, we tend to then assume that uh, suffering always convert, convey to you this uh, status that people desire. And it's not always the case. Uh, it, it, just give one example. During the war itself, uh, the, the Japanese uh, war atrocities was already discussed in the Chinese media. And uh, there are people who are saying this is actually not healthy because it weakens our will to resist. So at a time when you know, the, war, the outcome of the war was by no means uh, determined, this suffering and victim status is a symbol of weakness. It's not necessarily something people want to uh, aspire to. That's cultural. Yeah, but the question I, is why I, they so do it later. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I, I would like to address also for a second the, the issue of you know, different history of communism. So uh, Russia, of course, belongs to that group that they they do not remember being having something imposed on them, but rather creating something and creating it positive because the greatest memory is defeating fascism still until today, right? This in Russian, as, as you may know, the, the war is called the Great Patriotic War. And what, what makes it interesting then, you know, in Poland, then you think, in, you know, that is imposed. So you have this very different dynamic that you describe, but then you have Ukraine in the middle. And Ukraine, as, as a, a cleft country, divided in many different ways, also divided this in, on this issue. Because you can remember both the participation in the Great Patriotic War, or you may remember being victimized, which they were also, at the same time, b b both by the Germans and the Soviets. And there is a complicity both with the Germans and the Soviets. So you have the country with tremendously complex field of memory, where, where it can be taken almost in any direction. And in this picture that you outlined. 
Um, and on the question of why trauma, you know, let, let me try a, a theory uh, which comes from more, more from, I guess, social science than psychology, which is about boundary building and boundary maintenance between groups. Through, and the classical strategy, very effective, unfortunately, is through demonization. And when you demonize the other, uh, then you position yourself as the victim, and those others are monsters. It's very easy to create very powerful symbolic boundaries. So that becomes a kind of a useful cultural strategy of... of, of but but there, is a, yeah, there is a question, like Japan, in post-war Japan, the suffering is having a very dominant motif in education. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't necessarily create this demonic other, um, which would be the United States, which is the most important partner of Japan. So can, in other words, can yeah. you tr create trauma without the, ab the byproduct of the boundary of the demonic other? Let's ask Yoshimi Sasei to remark ask again. So this is about, uh, uh, let's ask, could you ask the question about, about uh, Create the victim, the victimization in post-war Japan doesn't be, isn't isn't a boundary creating demonic other involved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what happened to the demonic other, which should have been the United States? I guess you said. Right? Mm -hmm. Have you been to the Hiroshima Museum? I have. I have. Well, the United States Recently. is quite demonized. <laughs> Me too. Oh, oh. Dozo. Dozo. <笑>えっと、あの、so, so, so two two things about Japan mm -hmm. uh, that the uh, United States, the, the role of the United States was, uh, uh, rather than being demonized, was treated as a something that couldn't be helped. It was a result of the war, and instead, the second point is it turned Japanese war memory turned the victimization story into a mission for peace, never to make war again. So the dynamic was not a demonization, it was a, 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 um, a displacement, if you like, to, into pacifism. Uh, n n somebody else, Mark? Some other questions? Yeah, Mark. No, Carol, I'm going to attempt very primitively to answer your question about why. Okay, speak up, please. Um, in a very primitive kind of answer, I'll say a lot of this, I think, has to do with the character of the elites that took power after World War II. The question of the Cold War, the death of Roosevelt, that anti-communism replaced kind of anti-fascism, and so on. Now, leave it at that. Obviously, much, much more complicated, but it's just a very primitive attempt to answer. Okay, so that's a Cold War answer, and that's, the, I mean, <laughs> no, but that's, that's something that people often say. Other questions, please? Yes, Denise. Yes. Uh, I'm not convinced by the, the chronology proposed by uh, Asman. This is pretty good. Uh, I give you two examples. I, I, I like to uh, your your answers, please. Uh, first, uh, between 1944 and, 90, and 1949, perhaps. In France, and not only in France, uh, we have the place for all the memories. Sure, the most important memories memory of World War II is the memory uh, necessary for the reconstruction of France or the memory of Europe. Uh, but you have also place for uh, memory of victims and also for victims uh, to of Holocaust. Too. Yeah. And uh, so we have not this, you know, the separation between the first period and the second period, for example, period where the only, the, uh, based on the image 
uh, of uh, the figure of hero and after the figure of victim. Uh, it's more complicated in France and not only in France. And I think it's also linked to the position and um, political position of USSR uh, uh, in, uh, in front of the uh, creation of Israel. As you know, uh, if Israel exists now, uh, it's thanks to Truman for a part, but a large part thanks to USSR. That's right. And uh, I remember a uh, uh, discourse of, uh, pronounced by Gromyko in 1947, uh, explaining that it was necessary to uh, sustain uh, to, uh, yes, the, the creation of uh, a new state, a, a new Jewish state. And uh, uh, because of what they have suffered during World War II. So, uh, before 1950, uh, USSR was uh, for the creation of Israel, and I think uh, I can explain a part of this, the situation of the memory of Holocaust in this period. <coughs> and is uh, Eichmann trial a turning point? Sure, in Israel. Okay, uh, especially because before 1961, the f uh, most important figure of memory was not the figure of the victim of the Shoah. It was the victim, it, it was the figure of uh, the, the fighter. Yeah. And after 61, you have a seventh figure. The victim is a figure of victim. You can explain that. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. But in France, no, uh, no impact on French memory of uh, Eichmann crime. The turning point oh, in France oh, is perhaps between the, the middle and the end of 1970s. Right? Not before. Not before. At this moment, you have a new figure, which is dominant in the figure of victim, mm -hmm. and a new actor, the creation of Vichy, mm -hmm. as a French actor, mm -hmm. not as a German one. Mm -hmm. So it's why I'm, you know, when we know more the situation. Uh, in one country, it's more complicated. As you have shown with Poland, yes. when you sh when, when you turn to try to to build a you know a chronology of what happened in, in Poland, we see that we have not two or three periods, but five or six. And uh, <coughs> now I think the, the time, perhaps now it's possible now to organize a, a comparative analysis of uh, memory of World War Two in different countries, yeah. east and west, but not only in Europe and in the world. And so, yeah, yeah, you don't, the, the, years don't, the years don't have to line exactly. up, but some of the, the syndromes uh, are exactly. common, you know, even exactly. though the, the chronologies are different. Uh, this, we have time for one last question, and then I would like to put forward just quickly Manan's uh, notion of a, the need for a deconstructive memory and I would like to link it to the stories of the comfort women and to Dr. Danielli's uh, uh, 49 Ways of Not Listening, because it really has to do with the comfort women testimonies, which are being uh, questioned by the right wing in Japan as, mm -hmm. as unreliable and, and uh, uh, um, untrue. This, the problem with bodies and sexuality and violence against women, which is, which requires deconstruct, what he called deconstructive memory. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I'd like to get that to see if we can okay. make some comments that we can bring back to Manon. But you have the last question. Go ahead. And speak up, please. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, so it was a follow up on what Professor Gott remarked about why, I mean, why in China, for instance, like elsewhere with a very long and glorious history and so on, they, they choose to pick like one 
traumatic event, horrible, and make it the symbol of national identity. And I think I have a remark which turns into a question. The remark is that so the perception of humiliation and the narrative about atrocities, I think it's not exactly the same thing, because when the century of humiliation narrative develops, in the, it's, well, it's a bombing town narrative originally, more than the late imperial launching narrative. When it develops, when the it's war happens... We don't, we, don't hear you. we don't hear you. I'm sorry. It's a bombing town narrative. So it's the a nationalist narrative. narrative. Yeah. Okay. And when the war happens, as Professor Young said, Atrocities, they, they talk about it, but at the same time, it's a sign of weakness. So, and war is more perceived as a redemption, or at least on the part of the Guomintang, because it precisely puts an end in 1943 with the abolition of the, of the equal treaties to the century of humiliation, mm -hmm. which is diplomatic humiliation more than atrocities. And in the probably 1990s, I don't know if you would agree with this chronology, when Japanese crimes come back to the fore, the century of humiliation is reinterpreted as a victimhood narrative of atrocities, which w which it was not exactly in the same. Yeah, in, well, in that's the fine. I, so my yeah. question is, is it about like this atrocity thing uh, as like as the um, as the key to identity or national identity? Is this a natural process that happens in every country, or is this just the fact that when this discourse reemerges in China in the 1990s, we're already in a global discourse? And so, do they? Do, do you know if Chinese, like the Chinese state, and then Chinese non-state actors are directly inspired by models that exist elsewhere? Okay, that's a great question. So, what happens? What happens in the 90s when when the century of humiliation is linked to the atrocities and the victimization? Mm -hmm. it, and forget the earlier narrative because it was forgotten. Um, <laughs> is is this related? to the fact that victimization, primarily through the Holocaust in terms of global transmission, uh, already set a kind of uh, model. modality, yeah, yeah, or model. Model, yeah. Right. So that, you know, you, you join, because in a way it's true, there is, there's a contagion mm -hmm. of victimization. Now, victimization was the immediate post-war narrative all over the world, but there's a different <laughs> contagion yeah. of victimization in post-Cold War 90s. What about China? Um, actually, I think it's a good question mm -hmm. when you differentiated humiliation on the sort of state, more symbolic level versus this humiliation on the body, on the individual. And I think there is something there beyond just China. In a sense, uh, China, you know, after the Mao's death and the end of Cultural Revolution, the society opened up to some extent. Uh, in neighboring Korea, it went through uh, democratization. I think the focus on the victim, the people, the individuals, as opposed to just the you know, victimization of the state, of mm -hmm. the nation, mm -hmm. I think is, is a new sort of element that's that was great. not there before. That's a and that's, and that's the actually, distinction. that works the deconstructive part, because mm -hmm. these are mm -hmm. individual mm -hmm. people telling their stories, which are not part of the constructive. They get used, but they're not in the, they're not, part of the constructive. And um, one uh, thing to add uh, is that uh, there has to be a lot of lawsuits filed by the victims with the help of active Japanese attorneys as well as Korean Chinese. So that again highlight the individual status. In fact, that's a major problem for China and Korea because at the state level, they've had resolved the reparation compensation issue, but now it's the individual that is raising their rights. Exactly. Okay, that's, that's, the that's, very, that's, that's, that's yeah. very, uh, it, that changes the, it, it, it actually places the individual in a different, yeah, in a different position in, in public absolutely. memory. We're over time now, so what I would like to do, are there any comments that I can relay to Professor Ahmed about uh, your thoughts on the value of, de of thinking about deconstructive memory Particularly, this this sort of intimate, close. You said that it, you know you use it to distance. You you here, here this is the reverse of distancing when you're mm -hmm, talking. Mm -hmm. uh, any comments for him? I think it's a tremendously useful. It uh, is. It's wonderful actually. Because we're always concentrating on the constructive side. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Please. Yeah. Um, well, I the, 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 I would have perhaps more to say, but I, I I think that they really are mutually constitutive. As, as you hinted at, and sometimes they work, you know, sort of in the fashion of reinforcing each other, and sometimes they work and cross purposes, and they they pull people in different directions. Um, and I, I don't know if you're familiar with the book. I, I happened to review that book and had tremendous influence on me by an anthropologist, is a Vietnamese anthropologist, 
Henik Kwon. Oh, I, yeah. I, sorry, I, I pulled it on, on the screen. To, to, you know, it's called After the Massacre. Korean. Yeah. He's Korean. Well, he is, I think, but the book, he the may book be, book but, yeah, yeah. but I, I think Vietnam. he actually is described as a Vietnamese, but maybe maybe <laughs> from a Korean family in Vietnam. Or, the, the name is, is Vietnam, is, is, is Korean. But, but he, um, this, is, this is a very interesting argument, but the, the main line is very simple. That the commemoration of uh, it is about uh, uh, Milai and Ha Mi, mm -hmm. the two, those two villages, the pe people were improperly buried from the point of view of the culture of the villages because they were taken out by the state to mausoleums to be turned into the heroes of the state. If people are improperly buried in this context, the social harmony of the village cannot be restored. That's right. So what they have to do, they have to bring them back from the mausoleum in the capital city and rebury them. So the whole book is about the process of reburial, which is necessary in a society which values kinship sort of beyond death, right? <coughs> uh, 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 and that's, that's the whole book about it. So the, the people are caught in between, right? You can imagine that someone may be happy to have a, a hero, but then on the other hand they may be, they have to be unhappy if they are the members of the local community and take its rules seriously. So people are literally torn between sort of deconstructive and constructive mm -hmm. sides of things, a particular individual. So that, that's... Uh, that's the story of Antigone. Um, okay, <laughs> <Sorry>. so... <laughs> Anyway, I, I want to, because we're over time, I want to say thank you to all of our panelists and uh, especially Professor Yoshimi for coming so far and Professor Young, Professor Kubica, and Professor Achman, Dr. Danielli. I think it gave us a lot of food for thought. I thank you all for coming despite the lack of transportation <laughs> and I uh, hope that you'll join us again uh, for our future events in this series. Thanks very much. Thank you.